After I came to Pittsburgh, I brought my own pants and brought my own shoes. Your actions speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, I couldn't stand him, he couldn't stand me, and I wish the hell he'd have traded me. I don't understand what the beef is about. I feared the hell out of him. Like him? No, I didn't like him. And into the man of the year, Frank O'Harris's hand. I'm out there! The most important thing is what we do, and things of that nature. Hey, let us go out there and have a good time today, boy, you know. So on History Corner this week, Little Children's. It's Rich's History Corner. I decided, Simon, to, to do one in honor of you. Kicking specialists uh, <laughs> who were drafted in the first round in the NFL. Ooh. And you know, there's only been five. Two of them were hybrid kicker punters. That you know, the team wanted to save a roster spot, so they figured they'd get a guy that can punt and kick. Two of them were straight kickers, and one only one was a was a pure punter. Ooh. The earliest kicker drafted was in 1966 at sixth overall by the Redskins, and that was Charlie Gogolak. And Charlie Gogolak um, had the distinction of being uh, he had a style that the the Redskins thought this was something that could catch on. It looks like this guy's got something here he's a pretty accurate kicker and we're going to try him out so they drafted him in the first round he is the first soccer style kicker in the history of the nfl redskins drafted him also the uh, saints drafted russell eric's in 1979 he was 11th overall he was a hybrid kicker punter he set the uh, ncaa record for the longest field goal at 67 yards he never really turned. He never really ended up doing well as a kicker. Kind of a bust. Uh, his punting numbers were mediocre. He was okay. Uh, another guy that was drafted in the first round was by the Cardinals, 15th overall, Steve Little. He was a, a kicker punter hybrid, and he actually tied Russell Eric Slavin's record two weeks later in college <laughs> at 67 yard field goal. And so what year he, was that? Where were we up to in, in years? This was 78. Okay. He was drafted. So he didn't excel much in punting or kicking. He averaged about 38 yards per punt. He made maybe 48% of his field goal. So that was kind of a bust, too. So you have Eric Slaben, little busts. Charlie Gogolak was a decent kicker. So uh, then we have one team that drafted the last two players. The Oakland Raiders drafted Sebastian Janikowski in, in 2000, 17th overall. And it ended up being a pretty good. Pick. He played a long time. I don't have the number of years he played here, but he is the Raiders' all-time leading scorer. And he tied a record for the longest field goal at 63 yards. So the guy ended up being, you could say he probably was worth the pick. Um, now, the guy I really want to concentrate on is the last one. He was the only punter ever drafted in the first round in the NFL. He's drafted in 1973, 23 overall by the Oakland Raiders, and his name is Ray Guy. Hmm. Ray Guy was freaking amazing. I, you know, honestly, as a kid, I would watch Raider games just to watch Ray Guy punt the football. I mean, that's that's true. He was he was incredible. Um, I knew some of this stuff, but before I researched him, I didn't realize how great of an athlete this guy this guy was. Um, in high school, he played quarterback, safety, punter, and kicker, and he led his uh, high school team to two straight state titles. Now, he, there, there's a story that the high school track coach asked him to help his team out in the straight uh, state regionals one year because he wasn't on the track team, but they knew how good of an athlete he was. So he went with the team to the state regionals, and he ended up winning the discus throw and the triple jump. And he never did the triple jump before in his life, but they taught him how to do it on the bus ride to the event. And he goes and he wins it. <laughs> it's pretty insane. So um, he was also a high school pitcher. And he could, pitch a, he could throw a fastball 95 miles an hour, which is really fast for, for any level. Um, he ended up being recruited to play both football and baseball at the University of Southern Mississippi. Now, he excelled in both sports. In baseball, he struck out 260 batters in only 31 games. And he ended up being drafted by the Cincinnati Redskins of Major League Baseball. In football, in college football, besides being the punter, he was an All-American safety. And he still holds the school's single-season interception record of eight interceptions. He was also the kicker and once hit a 61-yard field goal to win the game against the University of Utah, which was an NCAA record at the time. As a punter, the guy was amazing. He, he was... <laughs> 
He was responsible for an outrageous 93-yard punt against the University of Mississippi um, that rolled out of the end zone and traveled a total of 115 yards before a fence stopped it. (laughs) It should still be going now, that punt. (laughs) It's crazy. Like, you look at these guys that get off big kicks every now in the NFL. Usually what happens is they go up, they travel about 60 yards, and then they get a huge roll, right? Yeah. This guy, I mean, this punt had to be over 70 yards. I mean, to travel 115, that's just that's just insane. And he led the NCAA in punting that year with a 46.2-yard average, a little better than our guy Barry, huh, Simon? <laughs> just a sub. <laughs> is this so, guy available? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. he probably still could punt really well. So this guy, Rick Cleveland, he's the executive director of Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame, and he was also a sports writer in the area for 40 years. Now, he covered a lot of players in his 40 years. He covered Walter Payton, Steve McNair, the Manning brothers, Jerry Rice. But Cleveland says to this day, Ray Guy was the best athlete he ever saw. So, you know, like I said, in 1973, the Raiders drafted Guy. First round, 23rd overall. So... One of his amazing abilities as a punter, the guy could do it all. I mean, but one of his amazing abilities was his height and hang time of his punt. In fact, the term hang time was coined because of Ray Guy. They didn't start measuring it until Ray Guy came along because this guy had this incredible hang time. Now, normally hang time was about 4.5 seconds. That's pretty good. Elite punters would hit around the 5.5, maybe six second mark. Ray Guy had a one year uh, had a punt of seventy one yards in the air, and it it was an eight second hang time. <laughs> eight second hang time in nineteen seventy six. That thing's not coming down with frost on it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? In nineteen seventy six, in the Pro Bowl, right? They were they were playing in the uh, Superdome, and um, Ray Guy bounced a punt off the bottom of the scoreboard that hung 90 feet in the air. So because of that, they had to raise that scoreboard up to, uh, like another 50 feet. In case it happened again. I love stuff but, like that. <laughs> oh, it's insane. People in the NFL, like, have never seen anything like this. In 1977, the Oilers punt returned, or a guy you guys probably heard of, because we all watched the um, 100 best players of or 100th year of football, the best players in the NFL, and um, Hall of Famer Billy White Shoes Johnson accused the Raiders of putting helium in the football. (laughs) (laughs) So Oiler coach Bob Phillips, he grabs one of the Raider balls, right? Takes it. And he ends up sending it to Rice University to be tested. And it came out that there's, it it turned out there was no helium in the ball. (laughs) So this guy's ability to stop dangerous punt returners from popping big plays was, I mean, was huge because he just, he would, the the coverage, he would outkick, you know, the coverage would, would come down and just be standing there and waiting for the ball to, to for the guy to fair catch the ball. I mean, it was it was insane. But this ability also it, it hurt his punting average because he did this a lot and he was asked on to do this a lot because there were some dangerous returners in the NFL. And so what happened? If if you look at Ray Guy's all time punting average, you'll see that it's not that impressive. But it doesn't doesn't absolutely doesn't tell the whole story. He's like 80th all time in punting average. His punting average is 42.4. Um, which doesn't really jump off the, the screen at you, but it's because he 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 was he was so adept at kicking these high punts that they couldn't return punts on him. And then every now and then, when he had to, he'd 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 bang a long one. He'd bang a 70, 70 yarder. He made this play one time in the Super Bowl. You guys got to check it out one time. That the ball was was uh, snapped way over his head. He he got up high, grabbed the ball with one arm like an Odell Beckham catch came down and just like calmly pounded the ball. Check it out. It's on I know it's on YouTube. It's really freaking amazing. But he did it like so effortlessly. But he ended up playing 14 seasons. Um as he got older, he really mastered uh when his leg got weaker and he got older, he ended up mastering the uh, how to how to uh, pin players back inside their own 20 yard line. And in his final seasons, he had 77 punts in his final 3 seasons inside the 20 yard line. It's just crazy. So so Ray Guy is the only punter ever drafted in the first round. He set the rookie record for punting average, which was 45.3. Three times he led the NFL in punting, and three times he was second. He was a pro bowler seven times. He was a first-team All-Pro six straight seasons and a second-team All-Pro twice. He's on the 1970s All-Decade team. 
And uh, the 1994's All 75th Anniversary Team. He was on the All Time Team put together in 2000, and he was in the NFL's 100th Anniversary All Time Team that we all watched on television. And last but not least, he is the first and only punter ever inducted, pure punter, that is, pure punter, ever inducted into the Hall of Fame. So the guy's just amazing. It was really fun researching him because, I, like I said, I enjoyed watching him play as a kid. And, I, I mean, some of these things I, I never knew and is just blew my mind. The guy's just just was an amazing athlete. So was he on all three of the Raiders – uh, yes, Super Bowl winning teams. Yes. So does that does that tie into the the point that the punters matter? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, look, you got to, you know, Al Davis, love him or hate the guy. The guy was a football genius, you know, and he drafted both of these guys, you know, uh, Ray Guy and, and Sebastian Janikowski, you know, and and um, I would say, I mean, you you know, I read interviews with Tom Flores and John Madden. They say absolutely, the guy was vital to their success. You know, there was so much you could do with the guy. And I didn't mention this in the story, but he was the third string quarterback. <laughs> you know, so just, I mean, these guys like this, they don't come around all that often. It's pretty, pretty incredible. That's awesome. Man. And what would you rather have, right? Him or Artie Burns? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so never tell me that uh, first round punt is out the question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder if we'll ever see it again. I mean, it's been you know uh, 1973. That's it would ha- it would take somebody pretty special. I'd be surprised just because of the optics of it, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, I suppose maybe if a guy just was so insane at the college level, you know, he could just pinpoint punts and you know he could, he could be used as a weapon. But it would have to be it have to be next level, right? <laughs> so yeah. that's the history awesome, of, of the drafted kickers recently has not been great, has it? Yeah, well, that's the other thing. Yeah, I think. It's difficult with kickers, right? They never seem to translate exactly how you expect them to, do they? But... Well, you know what killed these guys that I mentioned earlier in, the, in this Little and Eric Slaben that really killed them? Because they had those long 67-yard field goals in college, both of them. What killed them is in 1989, up to 1989, you could kick in college. Your, all your field goals and extra points were kicked off a two-inch kicking tee, uh-huh. right? It was like a flat block. It wasn't the kicking tee that you set the ball in and it stands up on its own. It's not that kind. It's the kind of, it's just like a flat block two inches above the ground and the holder would grab the snap and set the ball on that block. Mm. So that gives you extra, I mean, it made a big difference. And when these guys got to the pros, it, it really screwed them up kicking off the ground. And that's why a lot of these guys that were great kickers in college they came in the pros and they had some serious problems. But in 1989, they got rid of that tee because they wanted these guys to, to be more prepared for the pros and they wanted to be closer to the pro game. So they got rid of it, the, the kicking tee in 89. When did they get rid of the, the special kicking boot that had that wedge in the end of it? The guys that kicked straight on, they, didn't, they weren't like soccer style kickers. They just kicked straight on and they had a special yeah, boot. They on. had a shoe. They had a shoe that was, it wasn't really. I, I, I don't know how special it was as far as the material that was inside the shoe, but it was a it was a flat toed sh- uh, uh, football shoe. So you know how how shoes are rounded at the toe. These were flat and they were built just for kickers. And I remember my kicker on our high school team used one, and they would sometimes they would tie a shoelace around the cleats on the bottom and t- and then tie the other end around the calf, and they would raise that toe up even a little more. Um, so it was like a kind of a special shoe. But Tom Dempsey, who was the guy who kicked the longest field goal back in the, for the Saints, who was the first guy to kick a 63-yarder back in the late 60s, early 70s, around there, he was actually um, he actually had physical ailments where where he was born born without one hand and only half of a foot, and he kicked with that foot. And he he wore a special shoe. He wore a shoe that it was made of wood or something, and it was flat in front. And I actually saw him kick as a kid. And when he kicked that ball, it was like a cannon going off. He kicked the highest extra points and furthest extra points I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it's incredible the height and the distance he got on the ball. But he did have a special shoe. But the rest of the straight-on kickers, they just basically had a flat, flat-toed flat shoe. Or, yeah. What about the uh, the barefoot kickers? Mm-hmm. What happened to them? I didn't, didn't the Steelers have a barefoot kicker? Yeah, they did. I can't remember his name right I don't now. I remember his name either. It didn't last too long, I don't think. It was kind of a fad. Like, I guess, you know, 
it was something that the guy felt comfortable doing, but I don't I don't know how much it actually helped you, but <laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys know Billy White Shoes Johnson, right? That I mentioned from the yeah. uh Do you know what distinction he holds? No. First ever touchdown celebration. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> what did they do before oh, that? They just shook hands and <laughs> they just went lit, lit a ball, cigarette. Rap, shake yeah, shake their hands, shake hands with the teammates. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It was very it's very distinctive too. You guys should check it out on YouTube. I, I remember watching it as a kid. But what counts as a celebration? Surely surely before that, like other teammates must have run over and jumped up no? Well they would spike the ball and yeah, they okay. would jump each other, but as far as having a dedicated touchdown celebration. Oh, okay. okay. Like it like a a thing that they did.